Hello and welcome back to a new episode. Today I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite bands, King Crimson. Haven't talked about them in about two to three years time and there's there's a reason for that that mostly has to do with copyright but there are other reasons too. Anyway, King Crimson can almost do no wrong in my eyes. They've made one album that I don't like and it took them 30 plus years to do it but they did eventually do it. Topic for another day though. There are really no King Crimson albums aside from the one I just mentioned that I don't like. But the first half of their career is a cautionary tale on why having a stone-cold classic debut is not always such a good thing. You know, the first King Crimson album in the Court of the Crimson King, most people agree is a masterpiece, one of the foundational albums of Prague as a genre, and wildly influential on many people who aren't even Prague. But the band just could not follow it up to save their lives. You know, for th almost three years after that album's release, the band just kind of milled around. You know, they, the, the original band broke up, they formed a new band, that band broke up, and this kind of vicious cycle occurred where, the, where Fripp, would, Fripp and Peter Sinfield would make a band, they would record an album together, they would tour, and by the end of the tour, the band would hate each other and they would break up. This happened three times uh, although the one time they didn't even tour because Gordon Haskell, the singer for Lizard, hated the material he was being asked to perform so much that he just walked away at the end of the sessions and there was no tour. And that brings me to the album I'm going to be talking about today, Islands. Islands is kind of an enigma. It is easily the least rock King Crimson album ever made by easily the most rock King Crimson lineup. Because you've got Boz Burrell on, on vocals and bass, mostly known to the world in later years as the bassist for Bad Company, which is absolutely insane to me. You've also got Mel Collins, who I think in a lot of ways is kind of the star of this era of King Crimson in the same way that, you know, John Wetton is arguably the star of Wetton era King Crimson, and Adrian Ballou is definitely the star of 80s King Crimson. You know, he is the, you know, the other presence, and you know, on some of these tracks he really, you know, mixes with Fripp, and you almost get the sense that his, influ his you know, power as an instrument is equal to Fripp's, even though behind the scenes that was not at all the case, and apparently one of the things that actually led to the band breaking up was Mel Collins coming up with an idea, bringing it to Fripp, and Fripp saying, no, your idea sucks, or something to that effect. And finally, you have Ian Wallace, who is interesting because as a drummer, he's probably the most rock and roll drummer that King Crimson ever had, and that's true for Boz as a bassist, too. You know, the rhythm section of this band is very interesting because they don't do anything other than be the backing track. You know, they lay down the beat and they keep the beat going while Fripp and Wallace solo over the beats, for the most part. When they toured, things got a little weird, things got a little interesting, the band mutated in some very odd directions, and when they did improvs or or jams, or whichever you want to call them, that the line, I think, personally, in my opinion, I think the line is very, very thin. And, you know, it's, it's splitting hairs to call these one or the other. Anyway, when the band did improvs, they had a tendency to drift into, like, these weird bluesy jams with, like, hints of avant jazz and kind of a, sort of this weird funkiness that is completely absent from any other version of King Crimson before Tony Levin and Adrian Ballou came into the picture. And that's the other part of why the band broke up, is that they were moving in a direction Fripp didn't like. Because Fripp, I think, in the 70s, didn't like American music. Uh, he can't, or at least in the early 70s. So th I think he, I think he kind of came around on it when, in the later 70s when he was living in New York City and collaborating with people like Daryl Hall and Blondie and whatnot. But at least at this point, I, I think he was, he was Euro man, you know, who is, are going to be unstained by those filthy Yanks and their, their dirty, dirty ways. <laughs> anyway, the album itself is structured in an interesting way. You know, you have two very you have a very long thing at the beginning and a very long track at the end of the album. 
And those two tracks are kind of the same thing, the sort of weird, you know, space rock meets third stream jazz type stuff, you know. It's, it's almost like, I like to think of it as Sketches of Spain meets A Saucer Full of Secrets. And, and the Pink Floyd comparison is really apt because this album is all about textures and it's all about spaces. I think that's a part of why a lot of people who love King Crimson are not such a big fan of this album, is that it, it is a very spacey, very textured album from a band who usually weren't about spaces and textures. You know, King Crimson are about riffage and, you know, tangled, convoluted song structures and just sheer force and aggression. And this album isn't. And I think that's as good of a segue as any into the actual track reviews. So the album opens up with the first of the, I would say, the two tracks that justify the price of purchase for this album. Um, or at least streaming it now that Fripp has actually okayed King Crimson to be on uh, that sort of thing. See, I, I got into King Crimson when we didn't have that option and it was either pirate the albums or buy them. But uh, I digress. Anyway, Formentera Lady, to me, Part one of a two-part thing. I think this and the next track are really one song. You know, I don't listen to the two, either of them separately from each other. I always play them both back to back, but anyway. Begins with some vaguely Eastern-y orchestral stuff and some really sort of dreamlike vocals from Boz. I guess he, from what I understand, he didn't like performing this kind of stuff, and to my knowledge, this song was not really performed live very much at all. But he, he was really good at it, and this this really shows it. Eventually, you know, it, it sort of leaves the dreaminess and enters this kind of almost, oddly enough, trance-like repetitive bass and bass line over which you get these, you know, saxophone moments, and really jazzy stuff. It, as I said in the intro, it's the sketches of Spain meets a saucer full of secrets kind of thing that this, this album, or at least this track and the closing track, are all about. Um, and just really cool, magical stuff. The ending can get a little bit long sometimes. Like, there are days when you don't necessarily feel like listening th through to the full ending. But I always do, because it's worth it to me just for the transition into the next track. The Sailor's Tale, which is, again, to me, part two, rather than being its own thing, is absolutely phenomenal. I think for most people, you know, for most King Crimson fans, this is the one thing they save from Islands. The one thing that, even if they don't like the album, because this is a fairly controversial album within the sort of the discography of King Crimson. Even if they hate the album, they mostly like this track. And a lot of that is that it, it is very much sort of looking forward to Lark's. For the most part, this album is just kind of chilling and doing its own thing. But this is in some ways pointing the way to the future, but in other ways it's not pointing to the future at all. And I think that comes back to the rhythm section and to the fact that, you know, Boz and Ian Wallace for most of this track are sort of just, they're doing what a standard rock band rhythm section does. They're holding down the beat while Fripp and Mel Collins go crazy. And that's really kind of true throughout the song. You know, you got that intro with, with that, Thing that's great and then you have that awesome solo bit in the middle where Fripp is playing an electric guitar as though it were a banjo and it's just fantastic and then it kind of comes back you know goes back to the really fast bit from the beginning and then the song ends but that that holding down the beat quality is not something that would that it's not something that's there in the Wetton era because in, during the Wetton era you know John Wetton and Bill Bruford, they're the flying brick, you know, they're, they're gonna take off into the stratosphere and do weird, interesting things that Fripp doesn't always like, whereas, you know, here, 
Boz and Ian are going to do what Fripp tells them to do, at least in the studio. Uh, when they went on the road, that kind of changed, and that's, that's a pretty big part of why the band got broken up eventually, but at least at this point, they're doing what he tells them to do. But anyway, fantastic track, you know, one of the real highlights of the album. And you know, maybe, maybe this is what you should hear first from the album, but I kind of disagree, but moving on. The Letters is the first of maybe two tracks that I think a lot of people don't like or they find distasteful or even just a little bit silly. It's about a woman whose husband is cheated on her and the lover sends a letter to the woman informing her of this and then the woman kills her husband and commits suicide. It's kind of clumsy lyrically you know this is basically this is a this is the studio version you know with totally different lyrics of a very old track i actually think it dated back to the giles giles and thrift days called why don't you just drop in and i don't really understand why they didn't use the giles giles and thrift lyrics because those lyrics are significantly better than the ones they used for the letters. And, and, you know, maybe they wouldn't have quite fit this arrangement, but you could have made those changes and it would have, it would have been much better, at least in my opinion. Also, this is the point where I, I feel like I should mention, this album is mixed terribly. You know, it it's a wonderful album, but it is mixed horribly. I mean, you know, the, the quiet bits in this song are almost inaudible. You know, to the point where, you know, you have to crank it up so high and then when the loud bit comes in, it's like, oh my god, why? Why is it mixed this way? You know, it's, it's just, it's not good. Even though the songs are good and the album is good. And so now we get to Ladies of the Road, the King Crimson song about groupies. And, uh, it is, it is exactly what you would imagine it to be. The music is really, really good. I, you know, I actually didn't fully appreciate this until I got my record of this album and really, you know, listened to it. Because this opens up side two, so you gotta listen to it. And I really kind of grew to appreciate the music but ugh, these lyrics there are some it's almost nastier because they're trying to be poetic about it they're not you know frank zappa would have just straight out come out and said i did it to this groupie but king crimson are are being like stone-headed frisco spacer ate all the meat i gave her and that makes it worse. That makes it even more disgusting and more like, ugh. And this is, this track is such, it's a product of its time. I mentioned Zappa, but there was this fascination and obsession with the groupie phenomenon that was all around in the early 70s. All kinds of bands were writing songs about groupies. It was a very popular topic for rock music and not just like dumb meat-headed rock music but even like this fairly intelligent rock music you know honestly the funny thing about this is that for a long time i assumed because you know as i mentioned in the intro this version of the band you know boz and ian wallace and mel collins they are rock musicians probably more so than any other version of of King Crimson. I mean, Boz went on to play in Bad Company for most of his career. So, so they are into that kind of stuff. And so I assumed that this was probably made to placate them, but no. Fripp, apparently Fripp was very proud of this. He thought it was very good and it represented the rock and roll lifestyle. And apparently, uh, Peter, him and Peter Sinfield getting into a fight over this song is part of why Peter Sinfield left King Crimson. And so now it's time for Prelude, the Song of the Gulls, which is a weird little bit of classical music in the middle of this album. Once again, like the letters, it's pretty much an expansion, or at least the coda is, on something Giles Giles and Fripp did, uh, which is 
very interesting to me. I've never actually listened to all of the Giles Giles and Fripp album, but the fact that so much of, the, of their stuff is turning up on this, you know, one of my favorite King Crimson albums, really kind of indicates to me that I probably should listen to it. Anyhow, it, this track is one that, you know, when I originally got the album, I, was, I kind of took the attitude of, you know, this breaks up the flow of the record. It's kind of weird, it's kind of unnecessary. But now, I like it, you know, I think, I think it's, it works as what it is, you know, a prelude, you know, a little bit of weirdness before you get to the main course, and, you know, in my mind nowadays, the main reason for the album's existence. Which the title track to Islands is just perfect. One of the most magical moments in the entire King Crimson catalog, and it really does feel like being on an island and looking out on the sea and the tide slowly coming in as the waves crash against the sand. And all of that is, you know, all of that emotion of like, or even just looking out your window on a rainy day or across a field or whatnot. It's captured incredibly well. Boz is on point, Though, you know, everything is perfect, you know, the jazziness, the spaciness, everything just comes together perfectly, and you get one of those weird musical moments where it sounds like a, a genre that wasn't going to be invented for another, like, 15 to 16 years, because there are points on this track that, where it re actually, the entire second half, really, where it really sounds like Spirit of Eden era talk talk and that kind of early post rock and it's just phenomenal you know the with the chanting at the end and the big build up everything coming to a head you know it's just perfect one, you know one of the greatest moments in the history of King Crimson and an amazing way to close out the Peter Sinfield years and to close out the first four King Crimson albums and then it doesn't, because there's a hidden track of some studio chatter, and then what I, what I assume is probably practicing for the Song of the Gulls, or warming up, or something of that nature. There's a part of me that used to think that this was Fripp sort of flipping off Peter Sinfield as he leaves the band of, you know, of... You know, on this, what, I, what I've always interpreted as kind of being the Peter Sinfield King Crimson album. Fripp, you know, sticking out his nose as Peter Sinfield leaves. But no, that's, that's not what this is at all. Peter Sinfield was still in the band when they made this album. So I have, I have no idea what the purpose of it is. So that was Islands. Uh, it's an album a lot of people don't really get into, you know. It's... It's not quite like Lizard, where people tend to either really love Lizard or really hate and just despise Lizard. This one, it's, it's, it's a little more complex, you know. People tend to either really love it or really be indifferent to it. And I've, I've known people who are both ways. I myself was, it was kind of indifferent to this one for a long, for a long, long time, until about... Uh, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, I decided I was going to kind of force myself to listen to it a lot to sort of figure out what it was that took me so long to get into it relative to the other King Crimson albums. And once I'd done that, I just completely fell in love with the album, and it's, it's, it's one of my favorite things they did, it, and I like it enough that it's the only King Crimson album I own on record. Uh, which is saying quite a bit, because I like records a lot these days, and I'm trying to get records from all my favorite bands. I mentioned Lizard. I think that's significant because I think there's a real kind of yin and yang thing happening with Islands and Lizards, both in terms of what they actually sound like, and I think creatively, because I think, you know, at this point, you know, you've got Robert Fripp and you got Peter Sinfield. Peter Sinfield gets ousted from the band after this album, and his contribution to King Crimson is kind of downplayed after he's he leaves and I, I get that because he he didn't he wasn't a musician he didn't make the music he didn't write the music he contributed a little bit on you know live but he he didn't really do much aside from writing the lyrics of course but I but I think he contributed something because 
as soon as he left, King Crimson completely changed directions, and it it threw most of the sort of the the baroque kind of magicalness of these early records out the window and became just all aggression all the time, riffage, fripping, crazy solos, wild drum things, just all, all of the, you know, just all Robert Fripp all the time. And that's good. That's great. That's amazing. You know, the, the, the three albums that came after this are amazing albums, incredible albums, in many respects, completely superior to Islands. And yet, there's something just magical about this. And, and I, f I feel like whatever it was that Peter Sinfield brought to the table, this is the, p this is the purest distillation of it. This is his album. In the same way that Li I, I think Lizard is Robert Fripp's album. And, you know... Yeah, I, re I really, really like Islands. I think it's an album that you should listen to. I think you should, uh, you know, close out this video and find a way to listen to the album. It's on streaming now, so you've, you don't even have the excuse that you used to, as I think I alluded to in one of the song reviews. But, uh, yeah, so, that, so that's the album. Uh, I really, really like it. I hope that, I hope that you'll like it too. And so uh, I will see you next time with either the next Beach Boys review or a bonus review I'm doing as, as sort of like charity to the patron for for various reasons. Uh, I don't really know which one of those two projects will get finished first. But anyway, I will see you guys later.